Well, I'm Siobhan Daniels and I'm 62 years old and I'm living in my motorhome, which I have been doing for the last two and a half years. Um, Originally, I was working for the BBC as a presenter, reporter, producer for 30 years and I retired two and a half years ago and I got rid of my flat and most of my possessions and I bought my motorhome and hit the road travelling Great Britain to challenge ageism and uh, promote positive ageing, really. Had this been like a lifelong dream of yours or something that you wanted to do? To be honest, no. (laughs) When when I was in my late 40s, my daughter was heading off to university and I'd been a single mum for years. So I was heading towards that empty nest syndrome. At the same time, one of my brothers died, sadly, of uh, lung cancer. He was only 53. And I also had precancerous cells, so I had to have a hysterectomy although I call it my hysterectomy because I've never been the same since I had that done. But I had my hysterectomy and it all sent me in a sort of a bad place, really. And, and I was struggling at work and everything. So I took a gap year from the BBC, packed a rucksack and went solo backpacking around the world for a year. And during that year, I met so many young people and I just felt ageless and alive. And I had time to sit and talk to people and and really savour what life was about. So that set a seed in my head, really, that when I retired, I wanted to go travelling. I didn't know it would take the form of being in a motorhome or anything, but I just knew that's what I wanted to do. And then when I got back to work, I was experiencing more ageism in the workplace and being marginalised. And it was something that I was increasingly feeling strongly about that I wanted to champion positive aging. And I was also seeing people going out working really long hours to earn lots of money to buy stuff so they could fill the homes with stuff. But because they were working such long hours, they they didn't have the time to see friends and family, quality time. You know, you'd book to see somebody, say, in two months' time, and, and they were coming that weekend, and you'd probably have a hideous week, but because you'd booked them in, you had to see them. So everyone's kind of pretending this social life. And I just wanted to stop and live and show that you could live with very little um, and promote positive ageing. Just going back to your gap year, Tell me more about sort of your planning, you know, deciding where you wanted to go, you know, how that year sort of planned out for you, panned out for you, I should say. Mm -hmm. Well, I went to um, Trail Finders in Brighton and I spent about four or five hours in there with them as they planned out routes for me. They kept doing one and then it was too many continents or it was too many miles for my round the world ticket. So eventually they worked out that if I flew to Southeast Asia and did three months there and then went to Australia and did three months there and then two months in New Zealand and a month in Fiji um, and then I went to South America and did Brazil Argentina, Bolivia and Peru. So they sort of worked out that I just flew to the central places like to Bangkok and to Sydney and to Auckland. Um, And then when I arrived in the places, I just planned it really. I went with the flow. I talked to people, other travellers, found the interesting places to go um, and just travelled around on my own and stayed in hostels and met some incredible people, people that ordinarily I probably wouldn't have stopped and spent the time of day talking to. And I learned so much from them. Before you went on your trip, did you have any fears or concerns about taking on this adventure? Oh, if I'm totally honest, no, it was when I was actually sat on the aeroplane after I'd said goodbye to my friend at the airport. Um, I remember having a little cry on the plane thinking, oh, my goodness, I'm really doing this. What am I doing? Because all the excitement and the build up of it and everybody going, oh, my goodness, you're going around the world on your own. That's amazing. But when I was actually sat on the aeroplane, um, I was filled with a bit of fear. And I booked um, two nights in a, a proper nice hotel in Bangkok. And to be honest, those were the two loneliest nights of my trip. Once I started staying in hostels with like-minded people and other travellers and getting tips from them of what to do and what not to do, um, I felt at home and the fear just just dissipated, really. Do you want to share one of those magical moments that you had on that trip, one of those experiences which, when you think back to it, just makes you smile and makes you feel super happy? I think, actually, it was near the end of the trip Uh, when I did the Lara's Trail um, for Machu Picchu, I didn't do the Machu Picchu one. I did the one where you do, you go higher up and you spend four nights and just walking through the hills. 
and meeting the locals, um, people in Peru. I just remember standing outside one morning when I'd woken up and it was freezing and just looking around me and taking in the beauty of my surroundings and how lucky I was. Um, and I was coming to the end of my trip and I just felt it had been a life changing trip for me. And I remember then being overwhelmed with emotion. Oh, I mean, one of the things that sort of spring or the word that springs to mind for me is around change. You, you mentioned dealing with your sort of your daughter going off to university having that empty nest syndrome going through a hysterectomy having those pre-cancer cells you know losing uh, your brother going on this gap year you know lots of these sort of big I suppose life-changing events that have that have happened to you especially from your 40s onwards how do you approach these these changes and these difficult and challenging situations do you have a method I wouldn't say I've got a method, but but I think when I look back, what I what I did at the time, not unknowingly really, was was face the challenge, break it down into little bits, and try and work out a way that that I can do something. I mean, skipping forward to when I was in my um, early fifties, I ran a couple of marathons, and I went from being enormous and never having run and everything to 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 running the marathons, and having to to break it down and just walk a bit, then run a bit and do it. But I actually achieved it, and I felt so empowered the moment I crossed the finish line. I just remember thinking, I can do anything in my life. The only thing that's stopping me is me. Yeah. When you had that thought, you know, I can do anything, the, uh, anything in this life and anything that's stopping me is me. Did you set goals? Did you set plans? Did you, you know, how much did you plan for your future? Did you know that you wanted to retire at 60? Was that something that you were working towards throughout your 50s? I, I'm not a planner, bizarrely enough, to say how many things that I've done. I, my whole mantra is I, I say, my plan is to have no plan, to go with the flow and see where life takes me. And I've had a pretty interesting journey so far. But in my 50s, when I went, came back from the gap year and I went to work, um, sadly, not long afterwards, a couple of years afterwards, my sister died of lung cancer, also at 53. And that sent me into a real spiral again. I just couldn't face life. I was also going through, uh, I was in the menopause after my hysterectomy, I had a surgical menopause. I was struggling with that. I had what I called my cotton wool head. I couldn't remember things, couldn't retain things. I felt I lost my confidence. I felt very anxious and weepy and angry with the world, really. And at the same time, I felt marginalized at work. I was becoming invisible. I wasn't being included in major stories and things that we were covering. And I just I struggled. I completely struggled with life and I didn't have a plan. And then, like I say, my daughter said, well, let's run a marathon. Mom. Let's raise some money out of adversity comes opportunity, which is something I'd always said to her. So we ran that marathon and then we ran the London Marathon. Then I had some relatives coming over from Canada and they wanted to do some kind of adventure with me. So I organized and we climbed the three Yorkshire peaks in a day, which was amazing. Um, and then about a year later, in my late 50s, I went to Malawi with a group of entrepreneurial women. And we met women out there and, and saw how they ran their businesses and what they were doing. And we also climbed Mount Malangi, the highest mountain in, in Malawi. I did that when I was about 56, 57. So, I, you know, I've had lots of challenges that have just come my way and I'm, I'm I suppose I'm, I'm I'm a bit of a stubborn Yorkshire lass you know I won't be beaten so I, I give it a go and so far I, I seem to have found a way to do things yeah I mean talking about sort of your running and you know taking on the three Yorkshire peaks and heading out to Malawi and and doing these um these more sort of physical adventures you know, ha has fitness and exercise has that been a part of of your life has it has it evolved has it changed over time have you had it in peaks and troughs you know talk us through a little bit more about that journey yeah, it's been very sporadic with me. When I was at school, I lived for netball. I just was very sort of sporty and I absolutely loved that. Um, and I played netball up to my late 40s. Um, but no, I was, wasn't one for going for a gym gym to the gym and things like that occasionally I'd go to keep fit classes when Jane Fonda was all the rage and, and her videos were out but I never really got into it but I've always loved being outdoors I love walking um, so I've done that and 
and but I've never been a gym um, bunny and I've never really done lots of exercise so when I decided to do the marathons it really was starting from scratch and it was good that my daughter was was very pushy with me you know I threw hissy fits going oh there's too many um, fumes from the cars I can't run and I can't do this and she had none of it she just sort of put her hands on her hip and said to me are we doing this or what? Uh, (laughs) How long was your training for before the London Marathon? Uh, 16 weeks we followed a book actually I can't remember exactly the title of it but it was um something like doing a marathon for a non-runner and we followed this program it was from an American person and it was if you followed it they guaranteed that you would finish a marathon not necessarily as fast as you know as everybody else but you would finish it and it was all to do with nutrition and psychology as well that one of the things I really used a lot was going through the alphabet and they said to you, think of a positive word for every letter of the alphabet if you're struggling and you're running. So it's like A for amazing, B for brilliant, C for courageous, D for Dana. And it really worked with me. I had to, you know, a few times I had to dig deep. Um, I managed to finish um, the Brighton Marathon in five hours, two minutes. And I was really pleased with myself. Um and I, I've, I've just always kicked myself and think, oh, those two minutes, I could have been under five hours if I'd just gone that little bit faster. But I'm really pr- pleased with myself. And it was basically following all the, the guide from this book that got me through it. Then I thought I'd retired at my peak. I wasn't going to do one. But my daughter had other ideas and entered me for the London Marathon a couple of years later. And everybody said, oh, don't worry, you never get a place in the first ballot. Well, of course, <laughs> yeah, you've got it. I got a place. But she didn't. So I'm ringing around all the charities the next day and I'm saying, look, I will run for your charity if you give my daughter a place. So they did. So we managed to do that one together. But again, I'd let myself go and I'd put on a bit of weight and I wasn't fit. So again, I had to start from scratch um, and I managed to finish that one. I did that one a bit slow. It was five hours, nine minutes. But still, you know, I got round and I enjoyed it. And I just that crossing the finish line when you do a marathon, I cannot tell you what it does to to empower you and your feeling of being invincible and that you can face anything and I do go back to that memory many times especially in the last few years when I was working and and I was struggling with just how I felt um, in myself about how I was treated and and various things Um, I dig deep to those moments when I cross the 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 finish line on, on both those marathons yeah there's probably a lot of women listening who are probably thinking oh you know I'd love to run a marathon um but actually you know what I'm too old I can't do it I'm in my I'm in my 50s I'm in my 60s I'm in my 70s now or even women who are maybe in their 40s thinking no 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 I I can't run a marathon what would be your advice for for new runners for for women who are thinking actually you know I'm too old I can't do this what would your advice be for them Well, firstly, you are never, ever, ever too old for adventure. And that's the one thing that I'm shouting from the rooftops um, as I'm traveling around. So, I mean, obviously, people's adventures are different. But going back to what you said, if you want to run a marathon, I think, break it down start off with just going for walks getting the right shoes getting the right shoes is really important because I had the wrong ones to begin with and my knees were hurting but then I went to a running shop and went on a treadmill where they film you and I got the right kind of shoes and that makes a difference and if possible join a little running club I joined Sarah's runners in Tunbridge Wells um, and they were so supportive they taught us all little tricks to do to increase your energy and and she you run so many minutes and walk so many minutes and you keep doing that so you can comfortably run three miles but whereas I think a lot of people go out and just think they've got to run 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 run, and then they get tired and then they give up so it's just break it down and stretch a lot eat the right kind of foods and do the right kind of training and on the day you really are like a racehorse you're waiting to go you're chomping at the bit at the start line to just get going because your body's ready for it oh Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that you have talked about is, you know, is this positive aging, which I absolutely love. And I'm so pro age and anti ageism. But what does it mean for you? What does that look like in, in I suppose, in reality? Mm. Well, 
I, I think for me, it's just seizing every moment. My my brother and my sister and my father, who died at 50 when I was 16, you know, they all died relatively young. They didn't have the privilege and the opportunity to age. And I see so many people moaning about getting old and people talk about being old as a negative and they talk about wrinkles, trying all the time to get rid of them. And everything's anti-aging cream and anti-aging lotions and potions. And I don't want anti anti-aging. I want positive aging. I want us to, to age the best way that we possibly can. So just changing the narrative and saying pro-age cream, you know, so you look the best that you can. When we're born, we're all heading in the same direction. We're all aging. Some do it for longer than others. So let's do it the best way possible. Let's get into school and talk to youngsters and, and say to them, don't fear getting old. You know, one day you will be the old people. So you can start now changing the narratives and thinking about positive things. I mean, I, I wrote an article for The Guardian recently. And I put, you know, I've got lots of wrinkles around my mouth and, and I look at them sometimes and I think, oh, gosh, I don't like them. And then I think, no, I've laughed, I've lived, I've loved, I've earned all those wrinkles and I want to embrace them. And I have to train myself because I've grown up with that negative narrative about being old and wrinkled. So when I look in the mirror, I have to retrain myself. But I think as a society, we need to do that. And when people used to say to me, oh, Siobhan, you don't look your age, you look 10 years younger. I'd say, oh, thank you very much. And now I, I gently sort of say, well, actually, this is my age. This is what 62 looks like. You know, we've got preconceived ideas. We've got these uh, ageist stereotypes and, and the media and the newspapers seem to reduce us to body parts, crinkly hands or, you know, uh, arch um, hunched old people with walking sticks when they're talking about 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s and beyond. Um, and we're all we're aging differently and everybody ages in their own unique way. So just seize every moment and live life to the full. That's what I'm doing to just try and be positive about aging yeah talk to me about the retirement rebellion <laughs> well I just I just feel when people retire and they're talking about retiring and coming up to retirement it's all as if right this is it you're on the slippery slope now it's the end you know you're heading towards the end and to me I want to be a rebel and show it's just the beginning you know you, there's so much out there that you can do it's the it's the next phase of your life you know, it's the it's another chance to have more adventures. That's how I would see it as retirement. So, and there's quite a few of us out here now that are doing that kind of thing. And I just push myself out of my comfort zone as much as I can. Only recently, I've been working on a farm for five weeks in Dorset. I, I had no idea initially where I was going, what I was going to do, or who I was going to meet. I just saw a little post on Facebook, you know, this woman wanted somebody to work. And so I thought, do you know, that's exciting. I have no idea about that. And I went down and spent five weeks and it was fabulous, you know, just looking after horses, weeding, being in the Dorset countryside. And I've made a firm friend for life as well. But that's because I pushed myself out of my comfort zone. And that's me being a bit of a rebel. Yeah. I mean, Charles, it's it actually sounds really quite scary to you know, when you're taking early retirement, selling all your belongings, buying a motorhome, deciding on to go on this trip, on this adventure around Great Britain, they're, those are big, those big, big changes. And and like you said, like a lot of people do become very at, almost attached to their to their comfort zone, to their belongings, to having, I suppose, the stability that that a home and your belongings provide. What was it like, actually? selling your belongings minimizing you know it was so liberating it was it was traumatic in one way because I remember being on my knees in the, in my um, sitting room floor with all my possessions strewn around me and loads in bags up against the wall and things. And there were all the legal papers from when I, I parted from my daughter's father and rereading all those kind of things. It was cathartic in a way, but it was also sad that life had taken that turn. But so many things were, were easy to get rid of and those that were difficult. And I thought, oh, I'm not sure. I took photographs of them. So I've still got them in my mind but I don't physically need them. And you say about the security of a home and your belongings, this is my home and I do feel secure and I've got everything in my motorhome that I would have 
in in my home, but it's just scaled down. I've got a shower room with toilet and and, and sink and a lovely shower. I've got uh, an oven and grill and cooker and hob, and I've got fridge freezer, a microwave, wardrobe, central heating, and a sitting room area. Uh, you know, and I've got even more. I've got a sort of canopy to the side of it, so I've got an outdoors room, and it's it's just lovely. So it is my home, and I've also realised. I don't need much stuff to be happy. Uh, You know, I'm that kind of person. I've still got a few belongings because I'm no fool. There's going to come a day when I can't be jumping in and out of the motorhome and filling the water and running around the country. um, And I'll have to rethink. But I don't think that far ahead. But I've saved a few of my belongings in a garage at my sister-in-law's. She's kindly storing it for me. But other than that, I've realised I don't need much at all. It just clutters your life. Half the time I couldn't find things. Well, at least now I know where things are because you've got to be a lot more organised in a small space. Yeah. How was your confidence around driving the motorhome? Mm. Well, initially it wasn't so good. (laughs) Uh, I had a few little bumps, um, especially reversing because um, it's got a camera on the back, but it hasn't got any sound sensors. And so I'd go backwards and I couldn't gauge properly the distance through the camera. And then I did. And I think, oh, goodness. Um, But I've got used to it now. And when I first set off, I went up to the Yorkshire Dales and uh, the Lake District. And I did struggle with the very narrow roads. Um, I felt a bit panicky. Um, and I phoned my brother, who's who's got a motorhome, and he'd been doing motorhoming for years. And he just said to me, look, go at the speed that's comfortable for you. Just take your time and stay calm. And then the moment you find a passing place, then just pull over allow everyone to pass you and then start again but don't let yourself get in a tiz because then you'll start making mistakes and I got used to it and I've just come back from being up um, in Scotland driving around the Isle of Mull and Skye and they're all single track roads and things and I felt fairly confident a couple of hair raising moments but I felt fairly confident driving around those. Take us back to the start of your solo adventure around Great Britain. Now I I'm sure I know the answer to this already because you already said, you know, you're not a planner. You will go with the flow. How flowy was the trip? Was it was it a case of did you have were you thinking in your head, you know, what, I'm going to take 12 months to go on this adventure? Or is it more a case of, OK, I've got my motorhome, I've got my stuff. Let's just go. Were you trying to stick to some sort of routine, either two days here, one day here? Were there sites and things that you wanted to see as you were traveling around? No, I seriously, I just went with the flow. When I turned the key in the ignition, I honestly didn't know where I was going to go other than I was going to head up, um, go to the Peak District first. I went and had a few practice runs and then would go back to um, friends, you know, and touch base with them and then go, go again. But mainly I set off to the Yorkshire Dales and I booked, I just looked um, in um, Google uh, for a, a farm site, a CL certified location site, which is smaller sites affiliated to the caravan club that only take five motones, but they're usually in picturesque places. So I looked for one of those near Harrogate and found one and went to stay on a farm. And whilst I was there, I then started looking at the map and thought, what's nearby? Where do I want to go to next? And Google and found somewhere. And then if I liked it, I stayed longer. And that's basically what I do. I lie here on an evening, look where I am. I mean, I honestly don't know where I'm going to go after Monday from here. I'm going from here. When I finish this, I'm going to my friends to stay in Folkestone for two days. And then I've no idea where I'm heading after that. Do you ever get lonely? No, I'm really lucky. I do enjoy my own company, but I indisperse what I'm doing with meeting friends who I've I've known for years or family. But also when I was in the second lockdown, I was stuck in a field on my own for five months in Norfolk. I got to know an awful lot of uh, women through social media. There was a good tribe of women all talking about being pro-aging and and challenging ages stereotypes and things. And so a lot of them I've made contact with along the way and met for coffee and and had some interesting conversations. So I can seek people out if I need to, but I can bunker down and be on my own um, if I need to as well. Yeah. Um, With regards to money, are are you 
like fully retired as in you you're able to survive just on your pension or are you sort of still doing other odd, odd jobs um to earn extra income like are, do you have enough money to support your retirement for the next you know 20 25 years no, I don't. And most of my money, the money that I had spent, it cost me 40000 to get the motorhome and then insuring it and keeping it running and just the cost of living. And I only have a very, very small BBC pension. Um, so I do talks for the Women's Institute. I do talks for other groups. I write articles for magazines and for newspapers. Um, and so I earn a little bit of money that way. Not much. But then again, you don't need much. You know, I am managing to live off far less and I'm happy really really happy one of the great things that you've been doing is you have been documenting your journey you have been sharing on social media but you've also been blogging about all of your experience and I'd love for you to share a little bit more about that process of sharing your life online I quite enjoy doing the blogs. I don't do them as often as a lot of other people will um, because I, I made a conscious decision at the beginning. I didn't want uh, to spend hours sitting with a computer and writing and being indoors. I wanted to live. I wanted to experience the moment. So I tend to publish them once every month. Um, but it's nice. It's nice to look back through them as well. I, I've been on the road nearly two and a half years next month. And it's great to re- look back and, and, and go through all the emotions. Because when I went up to Scotland very early on, I went to a place, Loch Morlick, and I stood on the edge of the lock. And I, I've written about that extensively in my blog about how I just howled like a wolf really and got rid of all my emotions about the bereavements from my brother and sister my father and my mother had died just before I started doing this and uh, how I felt about feeling bullied and marginalized and having angry conversations that I should have had and I did all that out loud and shouting in the middle of the night on the edge of this lock and it was great to be able to write it down as well and to really know how I'd come out the other side all the anger and frustration that I'd held on to for years really went those negative things are still there in my life um, but I'm able to write in my blogs about how they've helped me and spurred me on and also helped me to save us special moments I wrote about walking along the cliffs of the seven sisters in the, in the south downs and being tearful because in that moment I felt so so happy that the, the, the light it was shining on the sea with the silver grey, the white cliffs in front of me, just looking round and feeling so happy because I was remembering the journey that I'd taken to get there and all of the horrible things I'd been through um, to get me to that point where I felt the happiest that I've ever felt. Oh, absolutely. Um, are you hoping to write a book about your experiences or turn all your blogs into a book? Yes. Well, actually, now you're funny you should mention that I've I've, I've uh, signed up with a literary agent and I'm actually um, I've been putting pen to paper all the way of a book in my working title is Ageless, Fearless Women. You can do it, too. Um, and hopefully I will be publishing a book later on this year just to inspire other women to dig deep and find the courage. Don't forget yourself. Because I, when I was in my mid-50s, I genuinely felt suicidal at one point. I was so low. I was in such a mess. I didn't know what to do after my sister had died and how I was feeling at work. And I just didn't know where to go. And I found myself sobbing in the toilet at work one day. And I just thought, I can't do this anymore. I'm absolutely broken. I need an escape plan. And I didn't know the escape plan was going to be doing what I'm doing now, but I just knew then. And so that's what I want other women to relate to me who who may feel lost with the menopause and the children are leaving home and feeling not valued at work, um, who are losing themselves, that there is hope. They can get to the, the other side of that and find a good, positive way of aging and living. I was reading on your website about you've got four values that you share. You've got authenticity, bravery, kindness, community. And even now, I still have a lot of um, uh, women say to me, oh, my God, you're so brave. I could never do that. And And I feel as though that almost happens quite a bit in the maybe sort of the adventure space or in the in the space where women are doing something which is seen as outside of norm, outside of what's expected of women to be doing. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about bravery, you know, taking these, taking these risks. Um, you know, yeah, share your thoughts. 
Yeah, I think it's interesting that, that you've you've picked out bravery because I think we shouldn't be shy to say, yes, we are brave. We are being brave and women can be brave. A lot of women are brave in their everyday life. The, the, the things they do bringing up their children, they put all their courage and bravery. They focus it on making sure their children have the best life possible and, and they, they do it for other people. And there comes a point where you think, I'm going to do this for me now. I've got this bravery. I'm going to use this bravery for me. And and facing that phrase, face your fears and do it anyway, um, is so true. And the feeling that you get, I'm frightened. Very often I, I can be frightened when I'm doing this of, of, you know, when just, for example, my hot water wasn't heating with the electrics and things. And that sort of fills me with fear, thinking, oh, goodness, what do I do now? But you work out a way of getting things sorted and the feeling that you get after you faced your fear and you've overcome it, it's, it's, it's a buzz. It's lovely. It's amazing. You feel alive and you feel that you're living. So women should go out there and be brave and, and they let, don't let your own limitations stop you doing it. Don't let your own fear of something stop you doing something and experiencing that amazing feeling. But yeah, I, I now do pat myself on the back. At first I used to say, oh no, oh no, I'm not brave. I'm not. Yes, I am brave and I'm proud to be brave. And I hope my bravery inspires other women to dig deep and find their bravery and end up feeling the way I do. Because like I say, I was broken in my mid fifties, but now in my sixties, I feel I've become the woman I always should be. I, I say no when I mean no, yes when I mean yes. I allow myself to be kind because I see that as a strength. I felt in the workplace, if you were kind, you were just trampled on. Now I feel I want to show that kindness is a strength and, and I'm proud to be brave. You're an anti-ageism campaigner and, you know, you are challenging ageist stereotypes. And I'd love for you to share, you know, some of the things that you've been doing and also maybe just give some advice for the women who also want to challenge these ageist stereotypes you know the type of things that they can be doing you know what would your advice be i'd say uh, for, for a lot of women the, the products that you buy makeup and things like that i would say start challenging this anti-aging labels on everything I, I i won a competition during lockdown and i got sent some really expensive shampoo and on the bottle it says anti-aging and i thought what the heck is that about you know anti-aging shampoo it's just it, it plays into people's fears so i would say you know challenge products try and buy pro-age things there's more cosmetic companies out there studio 10 makeup now they're all about pro-aging positive aging um there's um fashion brands with clothes that are all about positive aging and enhancing aging try and seek out those things and also change the narratives um try and talk to people and, and sort of say this is what my age looks like this is the reality of 52 62 72 and beyond um don't you know when people say oh you look younger than your age that isn't a compliment this is how we look and this is how we're aging. There's preconceived ideas and people want to push you into these boxes. The other day, somebody said, should this woman in her 50s be wearing this leather skirt? And I messaged, no, you shouldn't be using her as an object to have a discussion. We all age the way we want. We wear what we want and we do what we want that makes the way that makes us happy. So I would say that be true to yourself and age as positively as you can and try and change the narratives around it aging to something positive stop trying to change it stop trying to to slow it down enjoy it embrace it absolutely what are your uh, what are your plans for 2022 what have you got on the cards <laughs> well i'm doing like i say writing my book and hopefully i will be publishing a book at some stage this year uh, to inspire and motivate women I've also been um, booked by uh, one of the major caravan and motorhome show organisers to talk at their Peterborough show um, in April. Um, I'll be talking on stage about my experiences and how I've got to where I've got travelling in my motorhome um, and answering questions for people. I'll be doing that a couple of nights there. And then I really, really want to get to the Outer Hebrides in Scotland. I've done the Inner Hebrides, but I want to go and see some of the islands. And it's just fitting that in around COVID and, and being safe, really. So, um, but other than that, I don't have any other plans. I'm just going to go with the flow. 
Yeah, I love it. I, I, my next question is like, oh, it's a bit of a planny question, but it's, it, I suppose in a way it's not. Go but on. <laughs> would you, are you thinking about, would one of your dreams be, obviously you spent a lot of time in the UK and COVID, all that sort of stuff aside, um, would you ever want to take your, your motorhome over to Europe? Is that something that you've sort of dreamt about or thought about? I, I obviously know that that's challenging at this moment in time. No, the only place I want to go to um, remotely abroad is Ireland, which I'm hoping to do in the summer for about six weeks and go traveling around and meeting up with various people. Um, because I, my father was from Clonmel and we used to go there a lot and I've got lots of friends there. So I want to go traveling around Ireland. But other than that, there is so much to see here. I've only scratched the surface of Wales. I've still not been down to Devon and Cornwall because everybody seemed to go down there. So I sort of shied away from it. Um, and like I say, I'm, I'm obsessed with Scotland. I just love it. It's so beautiful. I love the remote places. So I've, got, I've still got so much more to do here. And before I, I started all this, I've traveled extensively in Europe and I've been abroad a lot. That's what I always used to do was just jump on a plane and head off out and didn't really explore the beauty of what's on my doorstep. So I'm thoroughly enjoying doing that. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. And Siobhan, where's the best place for people to find out more information about you, to follow you online and to keep up to date with your journey and your future speaking engagements? How can they keep be kept up to date? I'm on Instagram under Siobhan Shavoff. So it's S-H-U-V-O-N-S-H-U-V-O-F-F. Um, I've also got a website, which is siobhanshavoff.co.uk. And that gives links to my LinkedIn and Facebook and just keeps people up to date with what I'm doing. And a lot of people are... Um, messaging me on Instagram and asking questions and I interact with them so if anybody's got any questions or any queries um, please do contact me um, or email me um, siobhan.m.daniels at gmail.com brilliant I'd love to leave you with the opportunity to share your final words of advice and tips for other women out there who want to be a retirement rebel, who want to go on adventures, who want a bit of van life madness, apart from saying, just do it, what would be sort of your more practical tips and advice for other women? I would say, write down in a book what you want to do, genuinely, truthfully, what you think will make you happy and, and how you can age positively. Write down all the reasons that you think are holding you back from doing that then write down all the reasons that you think you need to do to overcome the, the the obstacles and just slowly work your way through that. Put the book away for months and come back to it and you will work out a way to have your adventure. It may not be as extreme as mine. It may be just doing something like meditating every day or going for a walk every day, but whatever it is that, that will make you age positively and make you feel happy, then you will work out a way to do it. Don't rush it. It will happen and enjoy the moment because once you get the idea, that's part of the journey. And when you're in, experiencing that joy, you look back and you see the journey you've taken and you think, yep, it was worthwhile all those moments where I felt fearful and I thought I couldn't do do it you see what you've overcome or you see what you can achieve and then you strive to do more and push yourself out of your comfort zone absolutely very very powerful Siobhan thank you so much for being a retirement rebel and thank you yeah. for coming on the tough girl podcast to share more about your adventures and living life in your van it's been absolutely amazing to speak to you and best of luck with your your book and I can't wait to keep following along with what's going to be happening next thank you very much it's been lovely talking to you Hey tribe i hope you enjoyed the episode with siobhan daniels what an absolute inspiration if you're brand new to the tough girl podcast welcome my name is sarah williams i'm the host of the tough girl podcast and the founder of tough girl challenges which is all about motivating and inspiring you while increasing the amount of female role models in the media everything that we have talked about today is available in the show notes at toughgirlchallenges.com so please do go and check it out just want to share some names of other incredible women over the age of 60 doing 
awesome things and um you can listen to them on the tough girl podcast which is absolutely fantastic so the first name i'm going to give a shout out to is alison nor so alison started running in her 60s and went from running eight kilometers to doing her first hundred kilometer race so alison is a married mother to two girls she's also a businesswoman and she can now call herself an ultra runner during the episode with alison north she shares more about what drives her and why she decided to put her trainers on at 64 and start running we learn more about her mental resilience and why she wants to encourage more women and men to take up fitness when they hit their 60s. The other incredible inspiration is a good friend of the Tough Girl podcast, the incredible and inspiring Rosie Swale Pope who we have spoken to two times now. So Rosie first came on the Tough Girl podcast about two years ago when she was sharing more about her journey of running 6,000 miles from Brighton to Kathmandu in Nepal. Rosie has had to pause that journey because of uh, because of COVID and what's been happening in Russia. So she's no longer heading to Nepal. Instead, she's doing some running around the UK. But I want to take you back to 2003 when age 57, Rosie began a five-year run around the world, traveling 20,000 miles to raise awareness for the early diagnosis of cancer. Rosie is the only person in the world to have completed this solo challenge unsupported and carrying all of her belongings in her cart behind her. So Rosie is now 75. She's going to be 70. No, she's just turned 76 years young. She's an absolute um, inspiration. Rosie also does a lot of work for a charity called A Phase Worldwide, which helps women in Nepal. The third incredible woman I want to give you a shout out to is Dr. Betty Holston Smith. She is 79 years young and she is running from between 60 to 100 miles per week. And during this episode, she shares more about her knowledge of running health and fitness. So Dr. Betty Holston Smith has a fitness level of your average 30 year old, but she was previously a 200 pound couch potato. And this is in her own words. She loved junk food and smoking. So Betty shares more about how she transformed her life 50 years ago. And this really is a masterclass told by a phenomenal storyteller who really does dig into the details and shares more about the running, the health and the fitness. So if you haven't listened to already, Dr. Betty Holston Smith, incredible, Rosie Swell Pope and Alison North. Now, there's over 500 episodes of the Tough Girl podcast and the episode's coming out on a Tuesday at 7 a.m. UK time. If you want to find out more about the incredible women, make sure you hit that subscribe button, visit toughgirlchallenges.com and just, just search through the episodes. I know I know it's not that search friendly at the moment, um, but just, you know, explore, you know, pick an episode which takes your fancy. Even if you're, you know, say you're into running, maybe take a listen to the climbers. Say you're into climbing, take a listen to the boxers. If you're into boxing, maybe take a listen to the kayakers. Because what I would say is it's not about the physicality of the challenges. It's about the stories that the women share about how they overcame obstacles, how they overcame fears, what their journey was like. And all of the episodes are full of so many practical pieces of advice and tips that you will be able to apply them to your own life, to your own challenges, to your own situation. Uh, Just a reminder, the final few vlogs from the Wales Coast Path are also coming out over the following weeks, every Wednesday and Friday. So please do go check them out. They are short 10 minute videos from each day when I walked the beautiful coastline of Wales, 870 miles, which I did in 50 days. I do hope you will subscribe to both the Tough Girl podcast and the Tough Girl YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. I'm also very active on Instagram at Tough Girl Challenges. Just want to give a big shout out to all of the incredible patrons who are supporting the mission to increase the amount of female role models in the media. especially in relation to adventure and physical challenges. I could not do this without you. I really do appreciate each and every one of you. If you'd like to have your name added to the patrons page on the Tough Girl website, then please visit patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash Tough Girl podcast. And you can find out how you can support. There are options from $5 or £4 a month. And there's also an annual option as well. All that's left for me to say is wherever you are, whatever you are doing, give it your all, give it 110%, get after it, go for it. Believe in yourself because I believe in you. Take care, lots of love, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.